Hey, I'm John Weiss. Welcome back to Table 17. We're on our Wednesday night class, our Ultimate Kingdom class, on Chapter 7, The Fall of Babylon the Great. We're in the second half of that chapter, and uh, we're in the fifth part of six parts. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence shall they, that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of her harpers and musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee and the sounds of a mouse of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee and the voice of the bridegroom and the and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee for thy merchants were the great men of the earth for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18, verses 20 through 24. The good times are now over and gone forever because the whore Babylon has been judged and has fallen. She has received her compensation for her inequities. There is rejoicing, exclamation mark. God has avenged the whore, exclamation mark. The stock markets, the money systems, the governments, the worldly systems established by Nimrod have utterly failed, exclamation mark. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life have passed away. These remain. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. The eternal and timeless have triumphant over the temporal and seasonal. Those who rejoice are saying, God, you were right all the time, exclamation mark. Every time you stopped me, it was your best interest for me, but I couldn't see it. Now I'm so thankful. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. The smoke constantly reminds us of a person, a nation, and a world destroyed because God was left out. That is hell, a reminder that man's systems will never work. Nimrod will not work, for he will return on and destroy himself. He will turn on and destroy himself. The beast and the whore are strange bedfellows that coexist so long as, the, as they complement each other. But if one exists to cross the other, but, what, but, but if one happens to cross the other, they will turn on each other with destruction and death. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many thunderings, saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he, hath, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Revelation chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. 
In Revelation 1.15, the voice of Jesus Christ was likened to the sound of many waters, but here Christ's voice no longer sounds like waters. People's voice, who have become like Christ and begin to praise God, take on the sound of thunders and mighty waters. Jesus Christ cannot return except for a mature and prepared bride without spot or wrinkle, who is in unity of faith and of the knowledge of Him. This preparation of the bride is the mission of the church now. We think we are growing because we, uh, we can cast out devils, but that is only the beginning of the kingdom. Satan has deceived the church in his doctrine. He is not going to be bound at some future date, but he is bound now by the name of Jesus Christ, exclamation mark. Today, in Jesus' name, we have authority over the devil, and, over, and he is no longer alive and well, as some would have us believe. He suffered a deadly wound when Christ went to Calvary, and because of that ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb already rules and reigns, exclamation mark. I'm going to read that again. He suffered a deadly wound when Christ went to Calvary, and because of that ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb already rules and reigns. The marriage supper of the Lamb was designed according to Jewish custom, not the marriage ceremony fam familiar to us. First, the betrothal became a binding engagement made before witnesses and legally. From that moment, the man and woman were made husband and wife. That was the relationship between Mary and Joseph when she conceived Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Joseph had no choice but to regard her as his legal wife because their arrangement agree, because their agreement to marry had been made before authorities and the contract made by the man, the woman, and their families could not be broken. The interim between the betrothal and marriage gave the woman a chance to prepare herself to be married. This is the period the church is in today. If there were a dowry, it was during this period that the groom gave it to the bride's father. That is what Christ did for us at Calvary. From, that, from this, we can deduce that God did not control when Christ will come again because he has done everything he can do. He has sent his Son and the Holy Spirit, but now he waits for until the world becomes Jesus' footstool and we, the church, become mature. Those steps are left totally up to us and the whole world groans, waiting for us to become grown. In that sense, we are the ones who will decide when Christ can return. If the decision had been God's, then surely his own son would have known the time of his return. But as he told the apostles, even he didn't know the day or the hour. In his omniscience, God knows, but he does not know in experience because he must wait for our responsiveness. We'll stop there and start again in a minute.